Um, so we're here to talk about building together, how to collaborate between design and engineering and the benefits of that and how uh, some specific strategies for how you can do that in your teams. Um, so like Julie mentioned, uh, I'm Tina Chen. I'm a product design manager at Slack on the platform team. And the platform team is responsible for all of the apps and integrations that you see in Slack. So that means everything that an end user sees when they use an app or integration, everything that an admin needs to administrate apps on their team, and everything developers need to build awesome apps and integrations. Um, and before Slack, I was a product designer at Medium and at Google with Simon. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Going to the other side here. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly introduce myself and then sit down until the end of the talk. But uh, my name is Garrett. I have been at Slack for a few years working with Tina on the platform team. And uh, Slack is one big thing. So we touch a lot of different parts there. Uh, before Slack, I was at Mapbox doing labs and uh, kind of exploring maps a bit. So I'm going to sit down now and let Tina take over. Um, so we split the talk up. So I was going to talk about a bunch of the strategies from a design perspective. And then Garrett's going to come in at the end and recap some strategies and add some color from the engineering perspective. So I thought we would start with talking about some of the common challenges um, that we face in day-to-day -day work. So here are the four that resonate the most with me. Um, the first one is that you spent all this time making an awesome design, you've gotten all this feedback, you've gotten a final set of approvals from all the stakeholders, you are ready to go, you hand it over to engineering. And guess what? Turns out a lot of things are not feasible, a lot of things are going to take way longer than anybody really wants to spend on it, and you have to go back and revise a significant part of your designs. That is something that has happened to me many times <laughs> over my career. Um, the second one is that you write even really good specs, hand them over to engineering, and then you know, a month or so later, you take a look, and you turn, it turns out like things were built very differently than what you had spec out, or there's a lot of like, you know, uh, miscommunication in some of the details, and you need to go back in and clean them up and recommunicate, rebuild some of those things. The third one is coming up with all these edge cases near the end of when your feature is supposed to go out. So you've, you know, you, your design is super polished, but it turns out, hey, there's like a lot of edge cases are going to add a lot of time, and you don't end up either capturing all of those before the feature goes out, or you have to end up revising your designs because the edge cases mean that you want to adjust something so it's a little simpler at the end. And then lastly, your release feature doesn't quite have the level of polish and craftsmanship that you were hoping for, or even your engineering partners were hoping for, because you know you want to hit a deadline, and sometimes you sacrifice a little of that polish to get it on time. And sometimes even like the 1.1 release doesn't ever really happen because everyone has moved on to something else. So these are the things that have happened to me many times over my career, and I would like to show of hands if any of this resonates. If you're like, oh, this has happened to me before at least once. Okay, so a lot of hands. So. Um, we wanted to talk about four specific strategies um, that we've done, we've worked on um, at Slack, and just in general, um, I think throughout my um, product design career, these are the four things that um, I've tried to do, and I think they've helped with a lot of these challenges. So we'll go through these one by one. Again, I'll talk about them from a design point of view, and then Garrett, at the end, will talk about them from an engineering point of view. So. The first thing is building strong design and engineering relationships. And I think really this is the foundation and something that if you do this right, everything gets way easier. Um, and what I mean by this is to think about even like the structure of your teams. So for example, having a smaller team, a more stable team, really helps in this regard. On the on platform, we used to be, um, you know, there's a couple of designers, a couple of PMs, a good number of engineers, and it would happen that a designer might work on like three different features at a time with two to three different PMs, with like two to three different engineering teams entirely. And so you spend a lot of time keeping people up to date, telling like, oh, I won't get to this by this time, but next week I'll get to this at that time, and keeping everybody up to date with like any design changes. And it's a lot of overhead. It is a lot to keep straight. So we've actually... Um, in the last three quarters or so, formed smaller stable teams, three sub-teams within the platform. Um, and each team has one designer, one PM, one eng manager, and like six to eight um, engineers. And it become, it just like reduces by like uh, half or, but it reduces it, uh, your overhead 
of communication by a lot. So you only really have like a smaller number of people to talk to, and then you can really focus on building good relationships with that smaller group and talk about how you're gonna work together and your rhythm. So this is a, a photo of the discovery sub team that Gary and I uh, both work on. And this is kind of the size of the team. And it's allowed us to move much faster and to be able to make decisions much faster. So some of the things that I do when I first work with an engineer, um, either like I'm new to the team or it's somebody that I haven't worked with a lot, I like to make sure we talk about how we're going to work together and not just about the future and just the designs and establish a good rhythm. So that means questions like, these seem, might seem really obvious, but there's a lot of interesting things that come out of these discussions like how and when, do you want me to share design work with you? Do you like to run things through in person? Do you want to like get a document so you can think more deeply about it? Um, I also establish the fact that I'm going to share designs really early if that's okay, but they're going to be really rough and to form like conversation around like the kind of feedback that I want. Um, I also really like to flag this as a thing where I'm like, I'm not going to try to get all the design decisions done, actually package them up into this perfect bundle and hand it off to you. Like that is not going to happen. I'm going to try to make as many decisions in parallel with you as possible, but I want to make the decisions that impact the things that you want to do first, so to unblock engineering. Um, so you can start you know, thinking about how it's going to be built while I can defer some of the design decisions later on, because feedback always comes in. You know, Even if you have really good design, you really adjust that as you get more feedback from other people on your team, and just making sure that that's something that they expect and something that I um, also know as I work on the designs. And then lastly, I really want to know what design decisions are really hard to change later on, because this can bite you in the butt if you don't do this right. <laughs> um, and sometimes, like, the, the things that can be really unexpected, even if you know how to code, like, the nuances of your particular product, the legacy, can impact this. An engineer knows this way better than you do. So um, being able to make sure that, like, these important decisions that are hard to change, I will make sure that we get all the feedback, that this is the right thing to do, we're not going to change them. But a lot of the other things that are easy to change, we're going to try them out. We're going to get more feedback. We're going to adapt. We're going to iterate quickly. And just making sure that you know what these things are ahead of time makes it really a lot easier um, to work later on. And then I also like to make sure that I talk to the engineer about how I'm going to give them feedback. So I'm going to give you a lot of polish and craft feedback as we work along, because I care. <coughs> and I want to know when you want that at the right time for you and not actually add more overhead to what they have to do. I want to know when early builds are available so I can like, kind of take a look. Even if you don't have to do anything about it, maybe I won't give you, give you any feedback, but I like to keep tabs on when uh, work is being done because if I can spot something early and say, oh, this is not quite what we want, or like, hey, seeing this live, that actually there's a better way to do this. If I catch it at the right time, we can fix it and make something way better. But if I catch it really late, no one's going to want to like, it's going to, you're going to fight some battles to like undo a lot of work. So the earlier you can identify these, the better your product will be. And then lastly, I want to know how you file and track bugs. And this sometimes is talking to more, you like an end manager for like how their team works. But having, having all your bugs go directly into an engineer's like to-do list makes it's so much more likely that all of, the all of the craft and polish is going to get done as opposed to like me imposing another document that you have to remember to check. It makes it much harder for an engineer, even a very well-intentioned engineer, to remember to do that. And so you know, having, making it just like part of the flow is really, really helpful. Um, and also along the notion of sharing designs, this is something that like, has stood out to me, and maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, but I'm going to say it anyway because I think it's pretty important, is that when you share designs, make sure you talk about them. Uh, and that could be in person, it could be over VC, it could be, um, you know, even a chat in Slack. It's all great. But if you're not having a deep discussion about designs, it means you're not actually getting to an, a shared understanding. And what I've also found is that engineers might sometimes be like, yeah, that looks great, done. And they're like, okay, I think. I think that's good. But it turns out, like, hey, they just didn't ask all the questions that they had. They just, uh, they're like, well, I'm 80% sure that's what they meant. Done. Um, but if you actually, like, are talking to somebody in person and discussing it and, like, really highlighting the, like, yeah, this is the design. I think it's this way, and I'm pretty sure, but not completely. Do you have any questions? You will get all those questions early. And that really, like, once you get all those questions out, you'll actually have a shared understanding of your design work. And if you don't do that, it's really, like, a one-way communication. And it's, 
it, you should have lower confidence that you've actually communicated the intentions really well. Um, and lastly, on this first point, um, I think it's really important to put in the effort to check in regularly when you're, when you're working with somebody for the first time, right? Because not all engineers are really used to working really closely with designers. And just taking that extra burden upon yourself to be like, hey, it's been a couple of days, it's been a week. Like, you know, have you started working on this? Or like, do you have any additional questions? Or like, I know you finished like, like this part of the feature, you move on to this next part. You probably don't remember any of the things we talked about in terms of nuances. Let's talk about them again. Really pays off. And what happens is that um, you don't have to do this for everything. You just have to do it like once. And this magic thing happens where your engineer is like, oh, I have a new build. Usually I'm a new build. Tina asked me to share that with her. I'll just share it with her. And then I don't have to do it anymore. They just reach out to me. And it's like a really nice cycle and habit to get into. So definitely get worried if it's too quiet. And just don't be afraid of reaching out in a nice, you know, not annoying way. Like, you know, some engineers don't like it if you just you know, tap on the shoulder. I usually just message them in Slack. But find the right way about um, how to, you know, poke engineer a little bit until they, like, start reaching out to you regularly. And then some specific examples that I have around this um, are just, I took some screenshots in Slack. Uh, it's nice to have everything tracked in Slack. It's very helpful for this talk. Um, Jamie is a front end engineer on the platform team. And this is like maybe midway through our first feature together. And she started just reaching out with things like, hey, these tabs, I've discovered that we use them in more places than you thought, which I totally didn't know. Um, and they don't necessarily work. Here are two links that you like, just live builds that you can look at and see how they work. And so I looked at it and gave her like a quick modification, knowing that this is now all the places. She gave some feedback on it. She like implemented it and then later like, this is like half an hour later, she's very fast. Um, I got like additional dev links to see the, the new adjusted designs in dev, and I could look at them and have really clear confidence we've communicated well because it looks, it's good to go, it's like super polished. Another example, this is with Garrett, is near the end of this particular project, which is a very like tight, tight deadline. So a lot of pieces were in flight, and so like we would often have these conversations where I'm like, I don't know, is this, are you done with this feature yet? Can I add design feedback? Um, is this helpful for you or is this like stuff that you all already know because you haven't implemented yet? And this is like the type of conversation that we have pretty regularly. So I would say like if you're having these conversations, you're really good on the communication spectrum. If you're not having them super often, I bet having more of this type of interaction will make like all your design dreams come more true or at least faster. Or at least like you will be less frustrated about it. Um, so the second point is to bring engineering in early. And the question that I think some people ask is, what if it is too early? And I have also asked myself this. And the answer is always no. The answer is like, there is no such thing as too early. Um, having shared context and understanding and alignment on like why, what, and how, super useful, even if you're only talking about the why. Because if you bring somebody in at the end of a project, the first thing they're going to want to do is understand like, why are we doing this? What are we doing and how are we doing it? And if you start even just the why conversation earlier, you don't have to have that conversation later on. And that person feels more invested in what you're doing together. They get a chance to influence the why if they strongly disagree with it or have you know, a perspective that you haven't thought about. It's really nice. And it can just be like a half hour conversation. You don't have to like say, oh, you're going to work on this full time. It can just be like, a, hey, you're probably going to be the tech lead on this. You're not going to start it for a while. But we're starting to define the problem come brainstorm with us. Or like, you know, I have some really early designs. They're super rough, but I wanted to get a sense of like, you know, is this the right direction? What engineering, you know, technical concerns would you have? Stuff like that. And I think, like, I've kept pushing this more and more early. At first I was like, oh, okay, we'll bring them in when I have like wireframes. I'll bring them in when I have like flows. I'll bring them in when like, I know this project is happening, exactly what the design direction is. But no, I keep pushing it further, further towards the beginning. And it's so far, it's always helped, essentially, as long as you frame, you frame like the problem well. So you don't want to be like, oh, we're going to do this right away. You, you have to be like, here's a problem, and here's where we're at, and here's where we're going. Um, so another thing that's kind of a fallout from bringing people in early is that sometimes nobody knows what's going on. Like, you actually don't know what you're going to do. Yeah, you have like the, the area that you want to like make progress in, or you have a specific problem you want to solve, but you really don't know how. Now you have a lot of people who I want to help figure that out, but no one really knows the answer yet. So how do you align a team 
um, on something super, super early. So one of the things that we've done um, at Slack, I'm sure many of you've done this in um, your own day-to-day -day, uh, jobs, is to have a design sprint. And who has actually run or participated in a design sprint at some point? All right, so a good number of people. Um, I actually find that if you, do, if you do this well, it's super helpful at unblocking some of the nebulous problems. And also makes like bringing people like less scary in the beginning. Um, so an example of how we run design sprints at Slack um, is this uh, workflows in Slack sprint that we did, I think, like almost a year ago at this point. So we really wanted to explore the notion of workflows. Like we had a lot of conversations about it in various combinations of people on the platform team, but like we were having a really hard time getting to something tangible that we could move forward. So when I run design sprints, I really like to have two things. One is like, what are we trying to answer? I make that very, very precise. Like, what is the thing we actually want to answer at the end of this design sprint? And also, what will we have at the end of this design sprint to make sure that like everybody is on the same page in terms of like what we want from it? Um, and then we run them in the in the style of like you know, like Google Ventures has like a wonderful book called Sprint that goes through this. It's similar to I think how IDEO runs them. Um, I'm sure a lot of this will be familiar. But like, you know, we start with a bunch of presentations around like. You know, what do we know about the problem? What are the type of like workflows that people use today? What's the kind of software they use? Um, just to get people all brought up to speed on a pre-existing knowledge. Um, so we were starting from like a level playing field. Uh, and then we do a bunch of brainstorming on sticky notes for like how might we regroup them into the types of problems and features that we might want to build. We split into small groups and do this like kind of one, two, three step flows around like one way, like type of feature that we might want to build to solve one of these things. Um, and then, because this was like a three-day sprint, we spent a bunch more time um, kind of individually working on some of these concepts. So like the designers did a bunch of uh, mocks that illustrated like, you know, what are the components that workflows could be. Some of the PMs wrote like system diagrams <laughs> around like what they thought like the semantic system of work was. Uh, we had some designers actually do some deep technical um, exploration into like, oh, we wanted to do something like federated search, where you could search anything in Slack. Anything connected to Slack, you could search, like you know, your Google Docs, your um, uh, Dropbox paper things, anything that you had, like what would that mean technically? And that was super helpful. Even though it was very broad, at the end of this, like we were able to say like, okay, here are some of the concepts that have emerged from it, and then when we talk about like we could build A or B first, everyone kind of knows what A is and kind of what B is, as opposed to like this amorphous blob of like ideas. So um, this has been really helpful, and we kind of try to do this at the beginning of any project that's that we want to do a lot of like open exploration on. The third strategy is parallel design and technical explorations. So this is something that I think is a little newer to me, at least. I think we've I've done this more at Slack than previous places. But it, they've been really useful for exploring a problem space quickly. So instead of like design, doing explorations, and being like, okay, we've gone to like as far as we can. Now we can over engineering, and they like look at whether it's possible or not. And then after they've decided what's possible or not, they hand it back to design. And design's like, okay, now I know it's possible. I'm gonna like narrow this down, and when it's done, I'm gonna hand it back to engineering, and they're gonna be like, okay, this how long it's gonna take. Um, that's a lot of back and forth. So we try to like intermingle that as much as possible and try to move in a way that's a little bit faster. Um, but this is very important if you're gonna do that to like make sure you have milestones, sinks, like goals, so it's not just like fun exploration time that comes up with cool ideas but not actually aligned around the thing you actually wanna build in the end. So just keep a note on that. Um, but I find that the you know, design concepts obviously are really, really useful for clarifying goals. Um, making sure if you visualize something, people can be like, that's what I'm thinking about, or like, nope, that is very different than the problem I actually wanted to solve. Um, you know, you can come up with a bunch of different solution concepts without committing to something, which is, I think, really important to make sure you've explored as far as you can go very quickly. Uh, technical explorations and prototypes, super useful for two things. One of them is informing design concepts, if you can play with it. You understand it much more differently than if you were just mocking, or even if you're prototyping as a designer, it's not the same as like live data. Um, and the other thing around this is that you get a sense of like technically how difficult it is, how long it's going to take. Because if you're like, I want to fight for this feature, this is really important. If you are armed with like, and we know engineering says it's going to take two months, we can do it. You're going to get a sign off. If you say like, I have no idea, it's going to take another month to figure out if it's doable or not, then you know, then everything gets pushed out longer. Um, and a specific example of this that happened 
recently in our team, um, is uh, Dialogues, which is a feature we launched um, for developers to build essentially forms in Slack, which opens up a lot of more powerful use cases for the types of apps that people can build. But this started as a project that was like, hmm, developers really, 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 really want free text input. Why don't we just add that? Um, because there's no way for users to give that directly to a developer unless they're willing to make a bot, which comes with a lot of other things they have to build for. But this has a lot of implications, right? So, so Jason is like prototyping, he's, he's an engineer, he's prototyping like kind of how this might feel, just try to see what's doable, hacking something together. Meanwhile, Bruce, uh, who may or may not actually be here, I don't see a Bruce. Okay, Bruce is a designer on the platform team who may have attended tonight. Um, and he was doing, oh, somewhere back there. Bruce is awesome, we should talk to him later. Um, he was doing explorations around like, oh, we do free text input, what are the implications? And the implications are people are gonna try to make forms. Like they're gonna like do all these things that have a lot of kind of UI complexity and maybe even, you know, there's some patterns that are good and some that aren't. So he's exploring this, he's exploring forms. Um, at some point, there's a lot of discussions in channels around like, are we doing forms, are we doing free text input, where's the border, what's the difference? And because of all this kind of parallel discovery, it turns out, hey, we should just do forms because it's better, it's not that hard technically, and it's like way better for users, it's better for developers. And at that point, when they started doing more like serious wireframes around it and looking at like, you know, what the forms features were, it was great because, you know, feedback that came from other parts of the company, which was like, well, why don't you just do the smallest part first, just do free text input. The team could be like, no, we've explored this, we're aligned, we know exactly the cost, we know why the experience is not as good, and it was a really good case for it. Um, and so when they started implementing, it was much, much faster. They were super effective. Um, they didn't have all this churn around like, oh, did you, did you think about X, did you think about Y? And the last thing I wanna talk about is how to communicate design specs and polish. Super important, near dear to my heart, very important part of the job of a designer. Um, so the problem with exact specs, so this is where we were maybe like a couple quarters ago in Slack. Um, we were really, it was very popular to share red lines using either Envision or Zeppelin because we just use all the tools. Um, or like a sketch plugin that does all the perfect red lines for you, you export them, you send to engineers. Not bad, but two problems. One, super fragile. Like, you know, uh, you know, you're doing your mocks, you have like, you know, 20 states or something, things get nudged a little bit. Hey, engineers are gonna implement exactly what you put in there, sometimes they're gonna be nudged. Not great. Um, and also inaccurate. Like, if I'm trying to share a piece of like a font style, right, for, for text that I have, like is it actually 18 pixels? Or do I actually mean to communicate like, oh, in our font system is actually like based on RAMs and that's what I want, or actually I want to use this class. I'm trying to replicate this the system on this page with this new feature. I don't want to build anything new. I want to be super consistent. So if we change it later, it changes here. So inaccurate, right? It's like it's a very imperfect representation of what I'm trying to communicate as a designer. So what we've been trying to do more and more of over time is to rely more on a shared language and shared standards instead of like exact pixels for some for a specific feature. And so what that means is stuff like this, which is a design spec. So many words, beautiful words. Words like, what is the submit button? What is like, what does that even mean? Well, like, you know, it should be disabled until the fields are valid. Like, what is the maximum character length? How do you treat all these things? Like, these, this is all captured, like, in the spec. Um, and there's, of course, like, images and, like, you know, more detailed spacing and everything, too. But it's super important to have that in there. So we're trying to use a lot more, like, language around what we're trying to do and how these things are defined. Uh, we also have things like, instead of, you know, measuring everything on every page, just talking about a shared rhythm, like what's our base grid unit? Like it's our base unit is four. And so you can tell if something's really big, it's gonna be this multiple of four. If something is smaller, it's that multiple of four. And so engineers have a much more built-in rhythm for how, you know, this is kind of how designers think about things. And you try to translate that into like how engineers hopefully will think about things and be able to make really smart decisions, you know, without necessarily having to consult a designer for every little, every little spacing nudge that has to happen, which we can do, but it's very time consuming. Um, and I think when I was putting this together, like how to build a shared language is often something that comes up because it's hard, right? Uh, Slack has 20 some product designers, uh, many more engineers, 
And even at that size, it's hard to get everybody on board, even on the design team, with like what the actual shared language should be, what the, you know, um, just even what the component system should look like and behave, and then also getting engineers to agree to that and have everybody speaking the same language is hard. So we were stuck on this a little bit, but more recently, we have found our, our pairs and our advocates in our cross-functional partners. So this has helped a lot. So an example of this is um, Slackkit, which is our component system, which is a work in progress. But it started with like, so Garrett has, as a wonderful front end, senior front end engineer, has noticed that a lot of engineers were rebuilding things. There was a lot of like redundancy in the code. It wasn't clean, it was hard to maintain. A lot of like slight differences, which just result in like a slightly eroded product experience over time. And he was spending a lot of time trying to wrangle that together into components that engineers could reuse, like style sheets that like, they could just refer to instead of building it over and over again. But he had questions like, what is a pattern that we want to perpetuate? What is a pattern we want to deprecate? You know, if I'm going to make this warrant, like this like alert system, like what are all the states that we need to capture? How do we make it robust? And so you need a design partner to like sign off on that stuff and actually like, you know, basically work hand in hand to create the system. And over on the design side, we had our master sketch file, which is all the things that designers use to reference, but we're like, oh, but these fonts, like there's like these two different styles, and there's like this too many colors, and you know, like we knew what we wanted, but we were like, oh, but it's hard to use because it's not in code. So you can't just tell your engineer, like, hey, use this component. It's all defined, just go ahead and use it because it wasn't clean yet. And so when we like got together and created like a place for that conversation to happen, a space for people to donate basically their free time and all of Garrett's time basically <laughs> to work on this, it just, oh, it was great. Um, we started getting them in sync. You know, we had designers just like getting uh, these component system, these components like cleaned up and they were just in code. And once they were in code, anybody could use them. We started getting rid of all this crappy code and cleaning things up in the UI. It was great. So that's the power of design and engineering advocacy finding, find your advocacy friends. Um, and this is something that happened recently, which is glorious. So 136 colors, so many blues, none of them are accessible. Uh, so many grays. They also have wonderful names that you can't really read, but they're very inspired, like, I don't know, like, Petunia, like, Brandon need a lot of these, they're, they're very good if you can read them. Um, but yes, yeah, so we had a lot of colors, uh, and there's just a like, really hard thing to fix, right? Because they're everywhere. Who has time to audit them? How do you know what the right colors are? But Garrett and Hubert, who's a designer at Slack, paired together. And Hubert cares a lot about these. They spent a lot of time figuring out what the right blue should be. And so together, they like went in, they scrubbed all the colors, they made a build that had only our approved, mostly contrast-friendly 16 colors that we wanted. And then you know we shared it and scrubbed it a little bit, but it was great. Um, it was fantastic. So yeah, so this happens when you work together. I'm going to hand this over to Garrett. Uh, we merged that colors thing about a month ago, and I think that was the most terrifying merge I've made yet at Slack, because we had no way of actually uh, rolling it out slowly. So hopefully no one noticed anything off. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is the part where I come in and tell you a room full of designers why they're all wrong and engineering is right. Um, no, I really, Tina covered a lot of it. I'm going to be pretty quick. I just wanted to color some of these things uh, kind of from an engineering perspective, and we'll have more time in uh, the Q&A to kind of talk through some of these things. But I'll go through some of these points and just um, kind of give our perspective on these things from the engineering side. Uh, some little background of myself. I was formerly a designer. I no longer call myself one because people in this room are probably far more talented than I would call myself anymore. So uh, I'm currently in the front end world now. Um, but when I go to places, I do try to look out and um, find designers that kind of think about these things um, similar to how I do. I think there's a lot of gray area there, and I think it's really important to kind of start finding these relationships. And so uh, I think as designers, it's really important to kind of understand uh, the different, I call it different flavors of engineer. And uh, what I mean by that is, here's a very oversimplified Venn, uh, Venn diagram that doesn't cover nearly enough skills. but. Uh, when you're working with engineer, uh, a lot of them kind of occupy some of those those shaded areas there, those places that uh, they might they may have like me might have a um, an interest in design uh, but work in the front end. Or uh, I don't know how many folks occupy the back end in design skills, but I know they're out there and those people are super talented as well. But 
Uh, myself, I'm probably in that green area, maybe a little bit more yellow these days. Uh, there's a lot of Slack engineers like that. We also have some folks uh, that hang out in that orange area there, this back end and front end folks. Those are folks that kind of deal with some of the hairier bits of the front end code, the infrastructure, APIs, uh, scalability, things like that. Um, but really, it's just one big smear. And so I think what's really important here is kind of within your own teams, within your own, especially your, your immediate teams, those really small cohorts, uh, figuring out what kind of engineer you're working with. Um, it's important because if you're working with someone who might have a uh, design or product background, thinks a little bit of the product, they might be able to uh, be an ally in, in some ways or give you some, an interesting sounding board for some of your ideas uh, from an engineering perspective. Uh, the folks that you know, lean a little bit deeper in the code, they tend to do exactly what you tell them to do. So you need to make sure to, remember, uh, to think about that and think about uh, kind of the information that you're giving them and uh, knowing that they might, they might interpret it uh, very literally. Uh, that middle area, if you do ever find those people, they are magical and should hold on to them because everyone will learn a lot from them. Uh, I've only worked with a few and I just, I wish I could continue to work with them forever. Uh, so bringing engineering in early. Uh, we t tend to approach product development with the system in mind. Uh, Tina covered a lot of this and uh, I'm going to keep kind of harping on the system thing. It's so important to kind of immediately start thinking about what's the system, what's the design system, I don't mean just a component library, but what are the pieces that make up your model? Um, and then uh, when you, when, as Tina said, when you bring them in early, it uh, does help kind of uncover some of those weak points. Uh, for engineers especially, we might be familiar with some parts of the code base that um, got a little bit hairy. We might know about some APIs, or you may have a feature that uh, seems, really, uh, seems really straightforward, but on an engineer is just terrifying because we know that that has to go and touch this other part of the code base that people haven't looked at in six months. Uh, so when you bring them in early, you really do kind of help focus some of those weak points and you can get ahead of them. As Tina said, um, they can kind of, their engineers I think are kind of scared by nature. We're always scared about like how people are going to use these things and where things will break. So uh, just the earlier the better. Uh, running these parallel explorations, Tina did an amazing job of covering this. Um, <laughs> I keep saying this, consider the system. Um, ask, the, ask the engineer which parts worry them. I love when people ask me this question, not just designers, but everyone. When folks ask you what worries them, they will tell you. <laughs> There's probably a lot of parts. Uh, if they, nothing worries them, then ask again, because they're wrong. <laughs> uh, and a strong design system, if you have established it, it makes this prototyping phase so much more seamless. We're getting closer there. Uh, Slack is really uh, pushing hard to kind of start establishing some of these patterns now that we've had a few years to kind of build up to the scale we're at. We're kind of looking back now and, and starting to look at what are the, what's the common DNA that make up these things. Uh, and as we're starting to pull out these components, you know, we're refactoring, we're bringing these things out, we're disentangling the code. Uh, I've found that as I've started prototyping, you know, when we do a hack day or something like that, it's so much quicker if there's already a library of things that you can start using. So if you've established a strong design system, if you've really focused on that, it makes this phase a lot more seamless. So clearly communicate uh, the specs and polish. <laughs> Build for the system. Uh, <laughs> keep, keep that system in mind as you're building these things and as you're communicating. Don't just send, you know, don't just send something that maybe it was greenfield, but make sure that you look at those things and, and you think about like, what are the parts of the system that this comes from? What are other familiar parts of the UI? Where the, where's the shared functionality? And uh, think like a computer. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say that engineers are robots, but they do build software for computers, and we all, actually, we all do. And so uh, when I say think like a computer, I'm just going to use a real, real tired analogy here. Um, folks are probably familiar with this analogy whenever people talk about component libraries. Uh, so we have your finished feature. It's perfect. Uh, it's this beautiful castle. It's got this drawbridge that goes up and down, turret and some soldiers and things like that. And, and yeah, there's some familiar parts that are common in a lot of sets. There might be some unique parts. Um, but when you start looking at it, uh, if, you, if you are kind of keeping the system in mind, when you start looking at it, you kind of start breaking it down into like, what it actually looks like. What are the parts that make this thing up? Maybe there's some gray bricks. There's a lot of gray bricks. There's some blue bricks. Um, you start thinking about like, what, are the, what are the moving bits? What are these things? Where are the, where are the shared, where's the shared bricks that everyone has been using? And uh, can we just reuse some of those things? When you start breaking it down to those things, you actually go all the way down to the very root level. And, a designer looks at this and like, yeah, here's a, here's a really common, this could be like the button of your system, right? This thing is used everywhere. It's got two pegs, it's this tall, it's blue. Um, but, uh, you know, a designer may look at this and say, yeah, that's, that's, that's the component. But engineers, even at this scale, still look at these things and just 
break it down. So, you know, they're saying, okay, so that's two millimeters from the side, that's eight millimeters. Well, wait, 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 wait. This thing says eight millimeters, but, you know, on this, on this spec over here, this is two, so, you know, what is this? So, the sooner you build that shared understanding and the sooner you start kind of looking at those base building blocks, um, the easier it is to actually start building around that. So, you know, and, you know, with that in mind, like, how does that, how does that finished spec, how does that finished castle break down into these building blocks? And then when you go all the way to the bottom there, how does changing those small components, how does that affect the overall system? When you go back and you say, well, actually, maybe this brick is a little bit different, don't just fix that one brick and then call it a day. Think about, like, how are other teams using this thing? How is everyone looking at this component? Uh, and how can it actually be built to, you know, have a little bit more functionality that can be, uh, you know, maybe you want to add some more properties to it, maybe you want to make it, you, know, you want to be able to change the color of it. So uh, how does changing that small component of the overall structure? And when you do that, then that thing has more functionality down the line. So I just encourage everyone to just keep thinking about that system, think about the things that make up your UIs, think about what's shared, what's new, uh, and then figure out how to standardize that. Uh, and finally, uh, collaborate on documentation. Uh, Tina was talking about this at the very end there. This is something we're doing right now. Uh, this is actually a very new spec. I've kind of been designing the guide on my own just uh, when I can, and I'm so thankful now to have some designers kind of come in and actually color my own ideas about what design looks for when they're, when they're describing these things. So in my case, I come to these things, I want to know, how do I, how do I implement it? What's the code? Um, what are the requirements? What properties does it need? Designers have to consider things like accessibility, reuse. Um, they might want to talk about font size, icons. What are these things that you need to consider? When you collaborate on documentation, it's not just that you're kind of building these standards on your own, you're actually building them together. And when you do that, you both have a stake in the game. Um, it means that you're both, you're both vested in this, you're both sharing this thing, and you're actually both referring to this thing when it's done. Um, and that's kind of, that's what we're getting to now, where uh, we've, we've got designers all kind of collaborating on these things and actually talking about these components in the same way, which is so exciting for me. Um, and so, and now it's a matter of, you know, making sure that all sides are kind of have equal equal say in, in how this should be crafted, and equal ownership of making sure that it's maintained and uh, pushed forward. So that's, uh, that's my two cents. Thanks. I'll give it to uh, Tina to wrap up. Um, so just wanted to revisit the common challenges. So hopefully some of the things that you've heard will help address some of these issues that we all experience. And I hope that you know, at the end of this, maybe in the next week, the next month, try one of these things, like have a conversation with an, with an engineer at the very early, as early as you can for your next project, even if it feels kind of uncomfortable, just see kind of how it goes. Uh, run a design sprint, even like half a day is plenty of time. Um, try it out. It's, pretty low cost, um, and I think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, start a design spec without red lines, just words, guidelines, and see how it forces you to break things down into the system that Garrett um, wants us all to remember. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I think this is the most important one, like look for your engineering design advocates. Maybe you already know who they are. Just like talk with them a little bit more about how you could help each other. Um, or you know, just look around your company and see the, design, the engineers that are like, willing to spend extra time fixing the design polish bugs and then just form a good relationship with them because that will really help you um, get to that last bit of craft and polish that is really, really hard to do. Cool. So thank you.